Thank you. Hello, everybody can you hear me? Okay. Well, hi, I'm uh, Gina Yanis, and my beautiful partner, um, George, was for formerly diagnosed with FTD on the 18th of March, 2018. He passed on the 31st of March, 2022. The interesting thing about George is that pre-diagnosis, he was part of an FTD research program. Um, a friend of his um, called him and said that there was a frontier-led research uh, program and they were looking for controls and would he be interested. Uh, he said yes. Uh, he went into Frontier, I think spent two or three days um, having NMRIs, blood tests and neuropsych tests. A few months later, we received a letter in the post and um, and it said that it passed with flying colors. He was in the top 96 percentile. And I said, what is this about? He said, Alzheimer's. I looked at it and I said, no, it says frontal temporal dementia. What's that? He says, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter, does it? Little did I know that three years later, I would hear those words again, frontal temporal dementia, and it would change our lives forever. It was in 2017 that I noticed changes in his demeanor. And during this time, George was selling his practice and um, beginning retirement. He became a bit more um, withdrawn. He was always really chatty. We'd go out to dinner and there would never be a moment's silence. Um, his family and everybody started to notice, notice differences. We thought maybe he's just starting to worry about retirement or becoming a bit depressed. So we sent him off to a psychiatrist. After a few visits, the psychiatrist noticed a tremor in his left thumb and decided to send him to a neurologist for an MRI, thinking Parkinson's. Well, I decided to take him to see Professor Simon Lewis, who did some preliminary tests in his office in early December uh, and, um, of 2017. Uh, we were scheduling a big family holiday. We were going to a niece's wedding in um, Chile, uh, Peru and the Amazon, Cuba, and then the Antarctic. So um, Simon decided we'd do the testing one on our return. Well, um, shortly after our return, we had numerous um, scans and psych tests with Simon Lewis. And thankfully, a, a short time afterwards, we got the diagnosis of FTD. I say thankfully, because as a lot of people know, this disease can take years and years to diagnose. Um, it doesn't come up in, in many scans. Um, so we were one of the lucky ones. Um, Dr. Burrell recommended we see, um, sorry, Dr. Lewis recommended we see Dr. Burrell who specializes in FTD. When we met with Dr. Burrell, um, he explained, um, he explained uh, the diagnosis. Um, he said that he believed George had um, progressive supernuclear palsy, which is a rare form of FTD. And he said that the life expectancy would be about three to seven years. George just sat there very quiet, listening, didn't say a word. When we left, we were standing at the lifts at Concord Hospital and he looked at me and his words were, please don't leave me here. I promised I wouldn't, not really understanding, what was yet to come, but I kept my promise. And here are just some sides of our journey. This one. No, nope, I'll try this one. There we go. I got it. I got it. Right. <laughs> this is George in 2016. Um, 70 years old. Um, fit as a fiddle. He, um, we would do bushwalks. My, uh, we um, went up my, Mount Kilimanjaro, did Milford Track. Those were our holidays. He would be able to do push-ups with each foot on a medicine ball and each hand on a medicine ball. He would do a number of chin-ups and he could hold a plank for up to eight minutes. Um, <laughs> very, very fit. And he looked after himself. He watched what he ate. Um, this is November 17. We we're already noticing signs and uh, things weren't right. And this is the first out of character thing that George did. George owned, owned a, um, an MX-5 uh, for 20 years. He kept it in pristine condition. Anybody that saw that car around town knew it was George. 
Well, he decided he would sell it and buy a Mustang. So that's what we did. We thought, okay, well, you've retired and do what you want. And he bought his Mustang. We decided to take a road trip down to Adelaide. Now, George was also a bit OCD. He used to keep everything neat and tidy. And when he packed, it was incredible. He took everything, put it on the bed, made sure he checked it once, checked it twice, checked it three times, and then neatly put it into his bag. I would actually put my clothes on the bed so he would do the same for me. <laughs> so, well, on this particular day, I noticed he hadn't packed. And I said, George, you haven't packed yet. He says, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that now. Grabbed a duffel bag, opened the stores, and just shoved things into the duffel bag. And I realized then, God, something terrible, terribly is wrong. Well, anyway, off we went on our uh, trip, uh, met some friends along the way where we stayed with, and they also noticed changes in George. This is towards the end of that big trip that we had planned before um, we had the tests done. Um, this is uh, Antarctica. During this time, George started having more and more difficulty, like not walking, but walking slower and slower, shuffling a bit more, started gaining a lot more weight. Um, and he became bladder incontinent. And it was difficult because he wouldn't wear, didn't want to wear incontinence pads. So when we got to Antarctica, you usually get onto a zodiac, which takes you onto land. And it's actually quite, quite cold. So I said to him, if you don't wear the pads, you won't be able to go on to land because if you wet yourself, you will freeze. And thank goodness he saw that uh, and, and, and agreed to wear the pads. So thank goodness it wasn't as difficult as it is for others to get their partners <laughs> to wear incontinence pads. Now in November 18, I decided we'd take a river cruise. I knew that it was gonna be, it was gonna be soon that we wouldn't be able to go anywhere. And um, this was gonna, that was the next holiday we were planning to have a river cruise from Hungary, George's place of birth to Amsterdam. Um, I thought, well, we're on a boat. It's not that big. And um, so I can't lose him <laughs> and uh, we should have a nice time. And we did, you can see him there smiling. Um, he was he was shuffling. He we ended up doing the uh, group tours with the slowest group. We used to always be on the fastest group, and now we're in the slowest group, and we were behind the slowest group. Um, it was very difficult for him to get around. Um, but yeah, we enjoyed it. Um, it was a bit of a challenge for me, but I'm glad. I'm glad we took that opportunity. So here we go, lost in Amsterdam. <laughs> The last thing George's son said to me as we were leaving was, please don't lose him. I laughed and said, oh, of course not. <laughs> well, we get to our Airbnb, uh, Airbnb in Amsterdam. Uh, we go inside and um, I realize, oh, there's a little convenience store down the street. Maybe I'll go and get us some stuff. George is laying in bed. I say, stay here. And I'm just going down to the corner pop up. I was gone maybe five or 10 minutes. I returned, the door's ajar and no George. Not to say I panicked. I ran down the street to where we had lunch before we arrived at the Airbnb. And I spoke to the waitress there. She remembered him. I gave her my number. I said, if he comes here, please call me. I did the same to the other shops that we'd stopped in, ran back to the Airbnb and then called my daughter in uh, Australia. Why I don't know, I think it's because she's a police officer, woke her up and said, he's lost, what do I do? Call the police. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Go. Call the Amsterdam police and gave him a description and where we were and they said, send a patrol car. In the meantime, the lady at the the lady, the waitress at the place that I had uh, spoken to called me and said she had a friend that was walking home that stopped in. She gave her the details of George and she just called her and said she found him and she's well on her way back. During that time, I believe the police saw him walking with her and picked him up and brought him back to the restaurant. So here he is smiling as it is that he's had two gorgeous, beautiful female police officers and got a chauffeur a ride <laughs> and didn't think at all how, how scared I was. <laughs> So when we got back, a friend of mine told me about this watch that she found online. It's a Find Me Cares watch. I believe there are a few others around uh, that you can get now. 
And it's really great. You could either have it on a lanyard around your neck or put it on a watch, on your arm as a watch. George loved watches, so he had no problems putting it on. It has a red button that George would press and it would call me. I would call him and would answer immediately. It had a tracking device. It told you if he was going any faster than 25 kilometers an hour so that he's been in a car or in, a, uh, in some bus or, or train. Um, it also alerts you if he has a fall. But at the same time, I actually got him a medical ID bracelet because I think if people find him, usually watches aren't the first thing they look for, paramedics and most people you know, see the ID bracelet. And um, and it's got my it had my number as an emergency. Here he is again. You could see the difference from earlier on, from just to twenty seventeen. He's gained a lot of weight. His face is a bit just you know frozen, and he looks a lot stiffer. This is April of twenty nineteen. By this time, I was going downhill. I was finding it harder and harder. Uh, to deal with it. And I knew that I needed some respite. Um, so I decided to put George into respite for a month. And I went off to a health um, retreat um, just to settle down and just kind of sit down and think of what was to come and um, how I was going to be able to handle it um, because he was declining quickly. What's around his neck is my house dress that I'd wear in the house in the evenings. George would often go and lay in bed during the day and my dress would be folded on my pillow and he'd wrap it around his neck. He was completely and totally attached to me. Uh, he followed me everywhere. I was his lifeline. Um, and he often had that, <laughs> that house dress wrapped around his neck at um, respite. I was able to call him daily. Um, there wasn't much uh, conversation. He was mostly yes and no's, but he was always really happy to see me. I think he was a bit afraid that I was going to leave him there. And um, I could see it in his eyes when I left, but I promised him I'd come back. And um, I'm glad I took that time because it really helped me for the rest of the years to come. This is his first fall, oh, sorry, his first fall in, uh, yeah, August, 2019. It's still working? Yeah. And um, yeah, he would sometimes go out and just have a little, there's a beautiful walkway by the water where we live and uh, very close. Um, so he went off this day and um, he decided he wanted to start running again, I think, because he used to be a runner and had a fall and people found him. And that's when the ID bracelet actually came in handy. So they called me straight away and I was able to, to collect him. Now, this is uh, November 19th. We went to Port Stevens. It was our last holiday. I brought um, a close friend of mine that would often come and help me um, at home. And she's also a masseuse. So it was great to have a masseuse on holiday. And uh, she would give George's, uh, George a massage every day. She would massage him often um, for me. And um, yes, yeah, so as you can see there again, the frozen face. And by this time, he wasn't walking. He was using a forearm walker to be transferred from bed to chair to shower chair. Um, so he was wheelchaired um, everywhere. This is the airplane hoist to get people that can't walk onto a plane. So they bring that over, take them off the wheelchair, transport them onto that. Um, and and it was really easy. He thought it was lots of fun and enjoyed the attention. Uh, and it's really great. The staff were wonderful, but you do have to call ahead to organize them because they don't always have them on every plane. So when that started happening, I ended up having to buy this steer chair. Now, luckily enough, I found that because I had been looking for something similar. When we called the transport ambulance, those are the ones that got George out of the house so we can go on that holiday because he couldn't walk anymore. Um, and um, and so they would they brought a chair similar. It just didn't have the trackers in the back, but with two poles on either side, they sat him down, they lifted him, and they walked him down. And the paramedic at the time had said, "We're trialing ones that are automatic. They're electric ones that go down." And he gave me the name of the company, and I called them, and I found this, and I purchased it because it was the only way. We had no lift. The only way to get him out of the house. Um, the cost is six thousand dollars. 
Um, I haven't um, put it up to sale yet. I've been looking to see if anybody knows of anybody that lives upstairs uh, up and can't get out, please come and see me. I'm ho happy to, you know, give it away if it's someone that has you know, financial difficulty because it is expensive. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, but that was really great. We take him, hoist him from the chair to there. We'd have to strap him. Actually, we'd use this once when he had to go to the ambulance and the ambulance says we can't do that because he would pull his arm out and hit the railing. And I said, we have to uh, constrain him. And they said, obviously they're not allowed to constrain people. So I did, I had these Velcro straps and constrained him and, um, and then and took him down. If not, the chair would go flying or his, his hand would break. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it, 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 was, yeah, it was quite useful. And then we get to the bottom and I had another um, hoist downstairs that I take out of the garage, bring it over, hoist them up. It was a massive job to do, but it was, it was the only way to get him out for a walk and some fresh air. So this is here where he's no longer could walk and he needed a hoist. That's a hoist next to him behind him. Uh, we would hoist him out of the bed onto his recliner every day and and back again. He was still eating at this time on his own and drinking but from a straw. And this is really great. One of the carers found this. It's called saleability. It's in Manly. They take people with disabilities and take them for a sale on the skip. And they have a hoist to hoist those uh, out of their wheelchair into there. George Love loved it and they just sail all around little manly harbor and and come back so i think it's like ten dollars is what you pay for it um so it's there for the community uh and i think they do it like weekly so it's at the manly skit club is you can call up about it or look it up i'm sure it's it's listed or ask me i can give you the details then COVID came so I was lucky, George was at home. I had a carer that was actually living with us. Um, she was a nurse in Brazil, but not a nurse here. She was really great. She had to leave where she was living and was looking for another apartment. And I offered her our spare room, which had an ensuite um, to stay. And she agreed to, she's a lovely girl. And so we had her there um, all the time. She worked three days for us and two days in an office. So she was able to work from home at the office. I had another carer that worked two days that came in and she lost all of her caring jobs. So I asked her that if she was willing to isolate with, her, with us, I would continue her on the two days and pay the two days and she could move in into my bedroom because I was actually sleeping outside in the lounge room with George because that's where he had his, um, his bed. I just thought it was the best place for him. So when people came to visit, everybody was around. Uh, and he also had a beautiful view out the window. <laughs> um, so, and she agreed. So I was lucky. I had two carers, George and me. So the isolation wasn't as bad. And when restriction, we didn't have restrictions, his family could come to visit with some precautions, but um, they were able to see George. So for that, I'm grateful. I'd say, you know, I'm thinking, I think this is close to the last smile. Um, they were few and far between. One thing he would do is I would blow him a kiss and he would be able to blow me one back. Um, I, I don't know, it's, you, they, they can't speak, they can't tell you much and you're always talking to them uh, about things. And I don't know about everybody else, but I was always telling him how much I loved him. And one day someone told me, have you ever thought telling him that you know he loves you too and be his voice? And um, no, I hadn't. So from then that day on, that's what I would say. I love you, darling. And I know you love me too. Because I knew deep down inside he was thinking, I can't tell her. And now I was able to tell him for him. This is a trip to the dentist. We had a few trips to the dentist using that wonderful stair chair. She was they're really lovely. Uh, it was just to be able to give him a cl good cleaning every now and then. It was getting more and more difficult to get into his mouth. He closed his mouth tight and we'd have to try to pry it open. Um, so we'd go and see her every now and then. And um, yeah, they were really wonderful with him and very gentle. This is us every evening that was snuggling him up in bed. We had the television up high and we just watched TV. 
um, every now and then. There's something early on that I have to say with Gus Lane when he was um, in bed, just uh, the bed out earlier on, I'd say maybe 2018, the end of 2018, he wasn't really speaking much. And you kept wondering, how much does he understand? Um, he liked to watch comedy, not comedy shows, but comedians, on stage comedians. And I was just so amazed sometimes that he would laugh at the punchline. I, I could not understand that because he had supposedly cognition was gone. It, to this day, I keep wondering. <laughs> Look at that. I'm a Professor How does that happen? What part of the brain? Because I, I just, I really found that really interesting that he would hear the, the comedian punchline. He would laugh. Now, was he laughing because everybody else was laughing? Maybe. Or did he actually get the joke? I don't know. It's just something that reminded me when I was thinking about watching TV. This is January 2022. That's. Um, his last birthday and the start of his decline. Um, I should mention that when George was bedridden and I told the doctor, that's when the doctor called palliative care. And um, so he put him onto the palliative care books, which meant that we had a nurse that could come as often as we thought necessary, once every three months, once a month, once a week. At first they came once every three months and then once a month and they would just check his blood pressure, check that he had no pressure sores, something that we were really lucky that um, we never got because I got George an air mattress, a, a pressure sore mattress, um, and they were wonderful. They really were because on one weekend, um, it broke and the emergency number wasn't answering, wasn't working. And so we had to put the other mattress on. By the time they came on the Tuesday, with us even rolling him back and forth, he'd already got a massive pressure sore. Um, luckily enough, we were able to treat it and get it back. And from then on, the mattress kept working and no pressure sore. Um, so yeah, palliative care at the time was coming in more often, helping us feel, figure out how to, how to deal with the pressure sore, at least the nurses from palliative care. But we only saw the nurses maybe by this, by this time we were seeing them weekly. And this is the beginning of palliative care. He was declining. Um, he was eating less and less. His teeth were holding really tight. We were, he was eating by syringe by this time for quite a few months. We were only giving him liquids by mouth. Couldn't get the syringe in between his teeth. We found that we were putting it in the side of his mouth and then when he'd go to swallow too much would come and he'd start choking. Um, so palliative care were brought in and they put sub cuts on him. Um, gave me uh, medication uh, in syringes um, to insert into the subcuts as needed. Um, he started groaning. It sounded like he was in pain. So I would have to determine when to give him the medication. Um, look, it's great that I had the service of palliative care at home, but it's not what I expected it to be. As a matter of fact, after he passed, the nurse, the head nurse came and asked me a question. She said, did you think the palliative care was going to be what it was? And I said, no. She said, you expected more help? I said, yes. Oh, that's what everybody says is what she told me. So I'm really disappointed in the New South, New South Wales system. Um, they would come for half an hour once a day. Later on, there were drivers. When you start end up getting more and more medication, they actually give you 24 drive hour drivers. They would come in to nurses, fill the drivers up and leave. I'd have to fill the syringes for the extra top ups during the night if they were needed. Waking up every hour in the hour in the night, really exhausted and tired not understanding what I was doing, wondering if I was doing the right thing, calling palliative care, we did have a number. Um, they did answer quite a few times. Sometimes they were on the floor, but they would call back. Um, so yes, I do have to say that um, this was the most difficult three months I went through, through the whole four years. Um, it almost, you know, destroyed me. Um, and, um, but yeah, at least I was there with him and I was lying by his side when he passed away on the 31st of March. <clears throat> this is a quote that I found and I really think that it, it said it means a lot. To truly love another person is to accept that the work of loving them is worth 
the pain of losing them. Uh, and that's it. So um, if anybody has any questions. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. That was beautiful. And I don't know about other people, but you made me tear up. It is so beautiful. Thank you. Talking about George and being able to see his journey. And I think, you know, there's a lot of light-hearted moments but there's also a lot of challenge mm -hmm. in in all of it and I think you've done a wonderful job of, of going through this with George mm -hmm. um does anybody have any questions or anything they wanted to say yes Jeff I, do that. Thank um, you. I know this is a journey and I know it's not over what you all need to guide now what's important to you yeah, <clears throat> I think just, after. Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so for those on Zoom, um, the question is, what are Gina's needs now at this stage? No. Um, well, yes. Now is um, you keep wondering and thinking while well, they're sick, what are you going to do afterwards? You know, and and in, in a way, a part of you is saying, well, you'll have a bit of a life again. You know, you'll be able to go out, meet friends, and um, it just becomes completely different. You miss them so much. Um, the house is empty. Um, it, your sense, your, what you had to do before is gone. You just feel that there's no sense of work for you anymore after spending so much time looking after someone. You don't really want to go out and see friends. You still feel very isolated and disconnected in to their world, you know, your world and their world is completely different. Um, it's actually hard when people keep asking how you're going. <laughs> well, you know that they, they're trying to be helpful, but it's, um, you know, how do you explain? You don't want to constantly say, oh, you know, it's difficult and, and find yourself a burden and then lose everybody. So you just keep saying, yep, yeah, everything's fine. I'm coping, but you're not. Um, after the funeral, everybody's calling for a month and then all of a sudden it's dead silence. Everybody goes back to what they're doing, which is what they were doing before when George was sick. Um, and um, yeah, you just lose your sense of purpose. And so I'm trying now um, to um, find things to do in the community and um, connecting with really good friends that I can really talk to. And I still have my wonderful FTD support group and the people in there that um, for me, they have been the best strength. You know, we even have a WhatsApp group. And if somebody has an issue or a problem, they post it, or if they're feeling sad, they post it. And it's incredible to see the connection with everyone. Everybody's there, we're here for you, call us, we understand. And they truly understand what you're going through. So they were really a big part of my journey and I've made some really close forever friendships. Um, so I do recommend that for anybody that's in this position. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Peggy. Uh, so just on the colleagues here, um, yeah, I know that this wasn't a good experience for itself. Um, I, I guess it's more of a comment. Uh, at some stage, Marilla, you might think you were still there. We had a presentation um, uh, and it's talking about how we had care. Uh, some time ago, we, we in the STD board group had a presentation from a group of nurses in Adelaide, I think called Nightingale. Uh, group or nursing, um, and their model just seemed so excellent. Um, and clearly, the New South Wales model does this. Um, so I was just wondering how we might uh, you know, try to influence the uh, New South Wales Health or uh, well, presumably that's the body to try to influence um, to 
adopt that same model um, up here in New South Wales. Would you suggest that that's the way to go, perhaps? Yeah, that would, that would 